We're talking about what design patterns don't have. So does this make sense to everybody? Is this, is this clear, clear as mud? OK. Uh, so when we're talking about design patterns, it's important to realize that a lot of these patterns are going to be expressed as a diagram. They're not necessarily going to be expressed in code. And to go with that is this code sample warning. I'm going to show you code today because this is a PHP conference. And I'm going to show you PHP code. And there's no Java or Python or anything in here. But the code that I'm going to show you isn't the only way to implement these patterns. In fact, a lot of times it's contrived to demonstrate the pattern. You would never, ever do this in an actual implementation. The idea is to demonstrate the relationships between objects. And some of the code that I'm going to show you isn't even finished. It's simply an interface or something like that. The idea here is that you can have a graphical representation of the pattern, a code representation of the pattern, so that you can put those together in your mind and take them with you. Because you're not going to have me when you actually go to implement these, these uh, patterns on your own. So the idea here is, is that that's, that's kind of the foundation that we're going to build together today. Now, if you're looking at the code or the diagram and you have questions, feel free to raise your hand. Don't be shy. I swear I don't bite. Uh, I want you to learn. This is your three hours of time. You guys paid to be here. Uh, you uh, came, some of you, a very long way. I know I spent 16 hours driving here from Maryland. Uh, you know, so you know, some, people, some people came from Europe to be here. So if, if uh, you have questions, please raise your hand and ask them. I, wanna be able, I, wa I want you to leave here with a clearer understanding of what we're talking about today. So the first thing that we have to do in order to understand design patterns is understand the foundations of object-oriented development. Who in here is familiar with the SOLID acronym for object-oriented programming? A few people. OK. When I gave this talk in Belgium, there was no one who raised their hand. So I'm going to start today by going over uh, SOLID and what that means and how that relates to design patterns. For those of you who are familiar with it, some of this may be a little bit of review. If you've never heard of this before, uh, then obviously it'll be new for you. Um, so we're going to go over that because it's really important to understand design patterns are best practices. And the best practices of the design patterns are based on these principles of object-oriented development. So we have to have an understanding of what are these best practices of object-oriented development in order to have an understanding of why the design patterns make sense. Or in some cases, like the singleton, why they don't make sense. So SOLID stands for this. It's an acronym. Does it look fam more familiar to anybody who didn't raise their hand before? OK. Five, five letters, five principles. The single responsibility principle, open and close principle, Liskov substitution, interface segregation, and dependency injection. Excuse me. That's wrong. Dependency inversion. Dependency injection is wrong. I, I will slap myself for that. Uh, and we'll talk about why that's, that's, that's wrong later. But dependency inversion. And the idea behind SOLID is that it helps us develop good object-oriented applications. The idea here is that we want to produce applications that are easy to reuse, easy to maintain, uh, that don't, aren't full of spaghetti code, that aren't full of lasagna code, which is the opposite, where you have so many layers that it looks like a lasagna when you're done. We want our applications to be well-developed, well-designed, and to make a pun, we want them to be solid. Okay. And so this acronym helps us to understand that. And I like these five principles because they really boil object-oriented programming down into something I can, kind of a checklist that I can check my code off against and say, OK, have I implemented these things? Yes, OK, I'm done. I can go home for the day. So let's talk about them e one at a time. And we'll start with the single responsibility principle. This is the S in solid. And the single responsibility principle states that an object should have one job. And that one job should be entirely encapsulated within the class. And that that one class should be narrowly construed so that it does that one job and nothing else. The, the big thing here is this concept of one class, one job. You want each class to have its own job and to do nothing else. 
The reason for this is that it's really easy to create objects that have tons and tons of responsibilities. We've probably seen them before. Uh, anybody in here use Drupal for development? A couple of you. Have you seen that object that has, I think it, it was like 47 methods on it in Drupal? There's one object that has about 47 methods on it. Yeah, that's, that's a candidate to re refactoring right there. Uh, that, that class is doing way too many things. And when we have a class that does way too many things, what ends up happening is it becomes unmaintainable. Not to mention we have a lot of code duplication, so on and so forth. It, it becomes a real problem. Now, inevitably, whenever I say one class, one job, somebody raises their hand and they go, what's a job? OK. That's a good question. It's a valid question. Uh, and it's, uh, it's important to understand. So here are some examples of jobs in an application. When you connect to a database and maintain that connection, that's a job. When you cache something, that's a job. So caching should not be handled by your controller. It should be handled by an object separate. Your controller may invoke the caching, but your, but your controller doesn't know how the cache works. Uh, instantiating an object. If you have the new keyword littered throughout your code, that's a code smell. Stop doing that. And we'll talk about how to avoid doing that as we go on. Routing, if you're writing a framework, routing uh, requests to various controllers, it's part of a job. Context management, data modeling. All of these things are jobs that objects do. And sometimes these jobs are very broad. Uh, sometimes these jobs actually have sub-jobs, and you have sub-objects that are responsible for them. For example, a database object, the database library is going to have a connection manager. It's also going to have some way of constructing a query. It's going to have some way to construct a result set. Uh, all of those things are part of that library of database code. Each one of those is an individual job within that database construct. Okay? But the connection manager shouldn't be responsible for assembling the queries. That's combining two jobs together that don't belong together. So if you're making a connection and then assembling a query, you've, you've really you've moved past the single job into two jobs. Same thing with caching. Well, um, you know, your controller may decide what to put in the cache. It should never know anything about the cache. You know, that's a separate job. That's a separate responsibility. So we build libraries. And this, when we're talking about large objects or large collections of objects, we're starting to talk about libraries. And a lot of times design patterns are used in library construction because you have more than one object that's working with other objects in order to create something. So design patterns are, are very prevalent in libraries. In fact, if you're ever building a framework, these are really important to know. OK. The other thing in the single responsibility principle that we talked about is this concept of entirely encapsulated. Now, encapsulated is a really big word that I had to Google the definition of first time I saw it. And basically what that boils down to, the object should be able to do with the job completely. If I'm maintaining a connection to the database, I should be able to do that job without talking to any other objects um, other than maybe PDO built in. Okay. If you've given me a job to do, I should be empowered to completely do it. Just like you know, if you, if you were at work, and your boss comes to you and says, I want you to do this thing. If you have to go to 14 different people in order to accomplish the task that you're responsible for doing, that sucks. You want your boss to not only give you the task, you want your boss to empower you to complete the task that you've been given. And that's the same thing here with objects. We want our objects to be able to complete the task that they've been given and without having to go out and talk to a bunch of other objects. Now, our objects are welcome to talk to other objects, other objects who have different jobs. That's not the same thing. When we talk to other objects that have different jobs uh, and delegate to those objects, that's fine. But I shouldn't have to rely on another object in order to accomplish my job. Does that make sense? Cool. Let's talk about the second one, the open-closed principle. The open-closed principle states that software entities, classes, whatever, should be open for extension and closed for modification. Now, I think I first read this about five years ago, and I looked at this and went, what in the hell are they talking about? There are two kinds of open-closed principle applications. We're going to talk about both. We're going to talk about the first one, uh, which is not as popular anymore, and then we're going to talk about the second one, which is what we're really going to focus on in this workshop. The first one's called Mayer's Open-Closed Principle. Anyone heard of this before? Okay couple of hands. For those who haven't heard of this before, 
Mayer's open close principle is this. Classes, once you've completed them, once you've published them, should never be modified. You can fix bugs in those. You can fix errors. You can uh, resolve small issues with them. But the API and the internals and the way the class works, those are set. Those can't be changed. The only way that you can change that is by inheriting from the parent class and overriding the functionality and the API in child classes. And subclasses are allowed to change the interface. The idea here is that if you're publishing an object, you want that object to work the same way indefinitely, backwards compatibility, right? This might be called the WordPress model, where everything is backwards compatible for the rest of, rest of eternity, and we can never, ever upgrade to PHP 5.5, because that would break things. Now, when this was, was created, the idea, you know, the, the idea was that, that uh, this, you know, this made a lot of sense for, for um, uh, developers at the time. However, as time moved on, we became, this became a little problematic. Anybody in here actually release code to the public? Okay. This might make sense for you if you release code to the public. But if you're working on an internal application at your job, you can go to the developer across the room and say, hey, buddy, I'm going to change the API on this, right? I mean, we can, we, can, we can work together to change the API. So sticking with the common... API doesn't make a whole lot of sense in the modern development world, especially for an internal application or something, a product that we're selling. So what ended up becoming more popular and more common was this concept of the polymorphic open-close principle. Polymorphic is another one of those big words that, that actually has a really simple definition. Anybody in here study geology in college? Okay. I didn't see any hands. That's fine. We're all, we're all programmers, right? You know. Uh, I actually had a geology major in Belgium. I don't know this. <laughs> How did he get into software? That's, that's a long story. Polymorphism is this concept that, uh, of a natural occurrence of things in different forms. If, if you go outside and you look at rocks, you see a whole bunch of different kinds of rocks. But all rocks have similar properties to them, right? They're made out of, of uh, elements. Uh, you find them, you know, a lot, some of them are volcanic, so on and so forth. Granites can have similar properties to quartz in some ways, but they all look a little bit different, okay? So if I was developing an interface for rocks, um, I guess they'd all have the same property of hard uh, for various values and, you know, whatever, whatever your interface would look like, but they'd all have different internals. They'd all be composed slightly differently. In computer science, similar principle, uh, obviously different implementation. The idea here is that an object works in different ways, but implements a common interface and common behavior. So the polymorphic open-close principle, which is, uh, by the way, incompatible with Mayer's open-close principle, says this. It says that the interface defines the object. And the interface in this sense is not the, PH the idea of a PHP interface where you type interface and then, a and then an interface name and define your public functions. What I'm talking about here is the public methods of an object. Objects know each other by their interface. And by interface, that means the way they can talk to each other. In PHP, if I have a protected or private method, I can't talk to those from outside the class or the object. So the only way my object can know another object is through the public methods that are available. And that composes and defines the interface. Whether I've defined an official interface specification or not doesn't matter. The idea here is that the interface is all of those public methods. Now, what makes this incompatible is the idea that the interface itself is open for extension but closed for modification because the interface is set, uh, but the internals are different. Okay, right? I've defined my interface. I say the following public methods are available. The following public methods will always be there. The way they work will be different. Okay? The arguments they take will be the same, but the way they work internally will be different. Does that make sense? Any questions about that? Cool. All right. Most of us now use this idea of the polymorphic open-close principle. Um, and it can be a little hard to get your brain around the first time saying, okay, I'm going to set my interface. I'm not going to change my interface in the future. But once you get there, it's actually very freeing, this, this concept that, that Objects are known by their interface. Uh, and it, it really helps us to, to develop um, great applications. So let's take a look at this 
in an example form of the open close principle at work. I have here a caching interface. Very simple, very basic. Most of us have probably written something that looks like this at some point or another. Uh, in fact, I think there's a, is there a PSR for this? Does anybody know? Okay. You're right, logging, logging was three. Uh, cache will be five or six. I can't remember the number. Okay, well this is, this is a very basic caching interface. Okay, it has four methods, get, set, delete, purge, right? <coughs> now we can implement this in a whole bunch of different ways. For example, let's say I want to cache to the file system. I've got an SSD, it's really, really fast. I want to cache on disk. I can implement this as a file cache. So my class implements cache, and I have my function get, set, delete, and then I didn't have enough space, so purge isn't on here. But I can you know, get the contents of a file, and I think that'll error. It'll give me false if it doesn't work, uh, and put contents of the file uh, wherever the path is, and um, so on and so forth. And I would have it usually, and it's not here because I didn't have enough space, I'd have a constructor that I would set the path to where the file goes. Okay, where the, where the file system storage is. And so, you know, this works. This follows the interface specification. Or, if I'm using PHP 5354, I can use APC, uh, which would, do, would look something like this. Again, implementing the same a interface, but adding different methods. And get, set, delete, all the same methods, and they're all, uh, they all, you know, they return sim basically similar things, uh, and you know the open close principle is is honored here. Now I haven't changed the interface at all. The interface is all the public methods that I set. I've only changed the internals of how this works because between the file cache and the APC cache, I'm using different functions and I'm storing things in different ways. But as far as my objects are concerned, these are going to be exactly the same. It doesn't really care which one of them it gets. As long as it knows how to work with this interface that I provided it, then it knows how to do it. Any questions about this? Cool. The third principle is the Liskov substitution principle. <coughs> this is the only one that's named after someone. The Liskov substitution principle states that an object in a program, any object in a program, should be replaceable with any other object of its subtype. Okay, and when doing this, it should not break the uh, the program. That you should be able to do this without breaking the way your application works. The idea behind this is that you should be programming to an interface rather than programming to an implementation. And when when you're developing an application, it's sometimes very easy to have two objects know each other and to know how they work and to know how, what their internals look like. But the idea here is that instead of knowing what an object does, you should only know how what an object looks like and how it behaves. And the concept here, th yes, the public methods. Uh, whenever I'm talking about interface here today, I'll be talking about the public methods unless I specify otherwise. Um, because even if so let's say you only define an object that only has one instance and it has a bunch of public methods. Let's say uh, you're doing domain modeling and you define your value object. Okay, It wouldn't make a whole lot of sense to uh, define an interface just to, just to define one subclass. Um, that would be kind of overkill. It would be okay in that case to simply define what your public methods are uh, for that. You're never going to subclass it. You know, It's only going to have one instance. That would still be an interface even though there's not a formal interface specification. Um, in the in the P, you know in the PHP sense, does that make sense? Okay, good question. So, um, where this is going is this concept, and we just talked a little bit about that of design by contract. Now, design by contract means is a philosophy that that basically says there there are three things that you should do. You should define formal, precise, and verifiable specifications. So, in PHP, PHP gives us this interface concept. Just because PHP gives it doesn't mean we have to use it. The idea of defining these formal, precise, verifiable specifications 
is saying my objects are going to look like this. Here's the way I'm going to design the object to look and behave, and whatever that comes out to be, that's the interface. Now, we can do this formally like this with the interface keyword. You can define interfaces in PHP. We adopted, we, <laughs> I wasn't there, they adopted interface from Java. This is kind of a Java thing. Uh, programming language is like Python. I think Ruby doesn't have this. Uh, this is kind of a Java-esque thing that PHP inherited. Okay, But you can define a formal interface specification. And each one of these is part of that interface. However, just because you, you don't have to define this to have an interface. This just happens to be one way of doing it. The important thing, though, to note is that when you define an interface like this, you can't define return values. But return values are still part of your interface. Even if you can't formally define them, what these return, because if you're expecting to get a string and you get an array back instead, that's not going to work so well. So when you define your interface, you want to think through what it is that you're going to be returning as well. That's the other half of the interface. And even though you don't define that, you probably want doc blocks, which again, not enough space on the slide. Put some doc blocks. Say, here's what I'm expecting to get back. Now, if you do this right, all instances of cache, the cache interface, should be substitutable for one another. You should be able to instantiate any object that implements a cache interface and substitute it for any other object that implements the cache interface. No questions asked. It should be, it should be possible to do it. And this is the, the idea behind the Liskov substitution principle is that if you do this right, any subtype should be substitutable for any other subtype. Now, it's important to point out that you should not be extending the interface. This is, an inter this is a violation of both open, closed, and Liskov substitution principle. The reason for this is that it, objects are known by their interface. I know an object based on the public methods that are available in it. If I start adding public methods to it, it's no longer of the type that I happen to have before. It's now a new object with a new type with a new set of behaviors. Okay? So if I'm type hinting on cache, but I start adding a whole bunch of public methods, and I start relying on those public methods, I'm actually no longer using the cache object. I'm using some other object that I've created of some other type. So what this looks like, you want to avoid doing this. Because in this case, you have a base class called you know, base class. Uh, with a function of do something, do something else. If you extend that and add a new method, you've now created a new type. Does that make sense? I saw you're kind of looking at me a little funny. In the, in, in, uh, it's open to extension only in the way that it works internally. I realized that as I was looking at the slide myself that it was a little unclear. And you're paying, clearly you're paying attention. <laughs> so, um, so, and I believe, I believe honestly in the open close principle, like the polymorphic principle, like in general, that that actually would be right. You could extend the interface. Um, but the Liskov substitution principle says that that would be bad. So together, you know, does that make sense? Right. So, so the type, and we'll talk about this. I have a bunch of slides on type. The type is set here when the interface is first defined. Now, you can type in on my class instead because now you've created a new type. When you change the interface, you've created a new type. Okay, that's legal. That's perfectly fine. Feel free. Have fun. Okay, but if you're saying if you're expecting base class or an interface, if you've defined an interface and you're saying, I want this specific interface, but you've added public methods to it, once you start relying on those public methods, you've tied your object not to the interface, but to that particular inter in instantiated object. And that's what we're trying to avoid here. Because if you type in on my class, fine. We know that method's going to be there. But if you type in on base class, and, you, and then you pass it a my class object and you use this do something new function, what you end up with is a, is a scenario where um, if you pass it something else, you just pass it an instantiation of this, that method doesn't exist. 
And so the Liskov substitution principle doesn't work. Does that make sense? And you code will work. Yes, you'll get a fatal error. The idea here, <laughs> yeah, the idea is you can take one object, pull it out, and put it in a completely new one, and it works just fine. Uh, now, that's not always possible. I understand that it's not always, you know, doable. Um, it would be really great. Uh, it would also be really great if the world was made of rainbows and puppies, but that's not how the world is. So, and if I, you know, had a billion dollars and never had to work again, that would be awesome, you know, but that's not, that's not going to happen. So, I understand that this isn't always possible, but this is, you know, this is a, a, a workshop. The idea is, let's build perfect code, and then let's actually go out in the world and, you know, do a thing. Does that make sense? Okay. Okay. As I said, extending the interface makes a subclass a new type. And let's spend a little bit of time talking what type means and what class means. A class is the name of the class that defines the object. Okay. So when you say class some name and then you start working, that class name is the name of the object. Type, on the other hand, is the way that an object behaves, the way other objects know it through its interface. The idea here is that my object uh, knows your object only based on the public methods available to it. So the type of object is based on what available public methods there are. It's not based on class name. It's not based on anything like that. Uh, it's based on, on how your object behaves. Does that, does that help clarify the questions, the couple of questions? Okay. Any other questions about this before we move on to the next principle? Cool. Let's talk about I for interface segregation. The interface segregation principle basically says that objects shouldn't be forced to depend upon or implement methods they don't use. To shorten that, some smaller interfaces are better. Well, I mentioned that interfaces actually define uh, the behavior of an object. The behavior defines the responsibility of an object. So the smaller the interface that you define, the better your application is going to be. And I like to use the Xerox example here. Everybody knows who Xerox is, right? They make the copiers. We're all familiar with them. Back, I think, in the 80s, maybe, maybe the late 70s, early 80s, uh, they brought in a consultant, and they were having a problem. And the problem that they were having was that uh, their copier, they had invented this new copier, and it could do all kinds of cool stuff. It could scan, it could copy, it could collate, it could staple. Uh, you know, it, 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 if it was built today, it would probably be able to email and fax and, I don't know, send messages to interstellar, interstellar civilizations or something like that. The problem that they were having, though, is that Every time they wanted to update the code, it was taking longer and longer and longer. And the copier was getting slower and slower and slower as they added new features. It was taking longer for anything to happen. And they were getting really upset and really frustrated because, you know, the copier may have been new technology, but their competitors were starting to catch up with them. And they didn't want to have the slowest copier on the market. And this was back before we had really, really fast processors. So you know, they were, they were doing their best to, with what they had, and, um, you know, they, they wanted to make their copier as fast as possible. So they brought in this consultant, who I'm sure was making an ungodly amount of money, and his job was to help them figure out what the problem was. What he discovered is that Xerox engineers had developed an object called Jobs, and the Jobs object knew how to do every job that the copier could do. It knew how to staple, it knew how to collate, it knew how to copy and scan, and all the stuff. It knew how to do it all. The problem was that this object kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and the way the object worked kept getting more and more involved. It was becoming unmaintainable. It was becoming uh, really, really slow because it had you know, more code to execute through. It was becoming a real problem, you know, and it was, it was basically, I think, single-threaded, so you know, it was one thing at a time. So he came up with this idea called the interface segregation principle. And he said, let's break this jobs object, which was a God object, into smaller objects and put them in libraries. So there will be a staple library with an interface. And there will be a collate library with an interface. And 
this might seem really, really simple, but at the time, this was a revolutionary idea in object-oriented programming. And he called this the interface segregation principle. And the idea was, by breaking these up, the interfaces would be segregated from each other. And the jobs object would know how to work with those interfaces, but it wouldn't actually be responsible for doing the work. It could spin off threads, and it could make them do whatever. And the end result was that Xerox's copier got a lot faster, the developers got happier, and I'm pretty sure this guy went on to write a book. So that's the idea behind the interface segregation principle. Any questions about the interface segregation principle? Now we come to the end of SALA, the D. The D stands for depend. Yeah. Okay. Another good example is um, SQLite, I don't believe, supports transactions, right? Okay. So if I'm devising a, a database object um, and I am creating an interface, I'm probably going to have an interface that looks something like establish connection, begin transaction, end trans you know, commit and roll back, right? The problem is that that doesn't work for SQLite because it's going to have to implement the methods that I don't have, transactions. So instead, it would be better to do a database, tra database interface and a transaction-aware interface and combine the two together when I'm doing MySQL Postgres and then leave off the transaction-aware one when I'm doing SQLite. Exactly methods that it doesn't know anything about and can't do anything with. Uh, so um, that's, that's another example of that. Um, the smaller the interface, the, the better off. Right. OK. So dependency inversion. A lot of people think of this principle as dependency injection. In fact, my slide is wrong. It said dependency injection. This is not the in dependency injection principle. Okay. Dependency injection can be part of this. And in PHP, I think this got renamed to dependency injection because nobody was doing dependency injection. So it wasn't making a whole lot of sense to talk about the rest of this when no one was doing the very most basic steps. Now most of us do the most basic steps, at least we should. Uh, and so you know, it's dependency inversion principle. And what this means is that high-level modules should not depend on low-level modules. Both of them should depend on abstractions, and abstractions shouldn't depend on details. Details should depend upon abstractions. Uh, did that go over everybody's head? Yeah. Let's boil it down a little bit. When you are working with an object, when you have a class, and you are um, working with that class, if you are depending on the concrete instances of other objects at lower level systems, you have a dependency. And your dependency chain uh, is tight, tightly coupled together. The idea here is to separate those dependencies out so that your higher level objects depend on abstract concepts of lower level objects, their interfaces, their behaviors, and the abstractions themselves shouldn't depend on the implementation details. The implementation details should depend upon the interface that you define. Is that a little bit more clear? It will become clearer, I hope. And if it doesn't, raise your hand and ask a question. So let's talk a little bit about type hinting. This is where dependency in injection kind of comes into play here. This idea of type hinting is that when we type hint, we're relying on a specific object type. Now, if you think back, I think five or six slides, we talked about types. We talked about how a type is a behavior in an interface. In this case, even though PHP will let you type in on a class name, you want to be typing in on the interface, not the class name. So um, you can type in on the class name if the class name is the interface, which we talked about. Um, but for the most part, if you're defining a library, you want to type in on an interface. Whether that's an abstract class or um, an interface itself, that's what you want to be typing in on. 
The reason is that because when we rely on these, abstract con on these abstractions, we free ourselves from dependency hell. Who's ever been in dependency hell? <laughs> dependency hell isn't any fun. We want to get out of dependency hell. Dependency hell happens when we have so many objects that depend on each other, we can't separate them. And we can't uh, reuse our objects, we can't work with them individually, we can't work with them independently. So the idea here is that if we rely on abstract concepts, if I rely on an interface instead of relying on uh, a specific concrete implementation of an object, then we're, I'm better off. The other thing that we do here is because we're relying on objects, excuse me, interfaces instead of objects, we make testing possible. Uh, you all in here write tests, right? Uh huh. This is uh, Chris Hargis. Everybody know who Chris Hargis is? Yeah, he's he's going to be here, uh, so you better start writing tests before he gets here tomorrow. Because <laughs> seriously, that's that's what he looks like. He's uh, he's 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 taller than I am, and bald, and very angry when you don't write tests. So uh, he's giving a testing talk that I highly recommend you go to. Any questions about the dependency inversion principles or any of the solid principles? We've gone through all five of them, and that sets our foundation. We're going to start talking about design patterns. Any questions before we do that? I don't think I've lost anybody, so I'm assuming you're all still with me. So let's, let's talk about what you all came for. Let's talk about design patterns. We're going to cover... See one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, ten design patterns today, and these are what I would consider to be the most common design patterns you will encounter in object-oriented programming. All of these design patterns are in the Gang of Four books. Anybody here read the Gang of Four books? More or less, yeah. Anybody want to throw their book out the window or fall asleep reading it? Yeah, yeah. I when I wrote my book. I use the Gang of Four book as research. Um, I'm pretty sure my cats woke me up drooling on it in the middle of the night. <sighs> I'm like, what do you, you turn out the lights? It's bright in here. It's two in the morning, Dad. Let's let's go to sleep. Um, which is part of why I wrote the book. It's it's, it's really it's it's not it's boring, um, but it's valuable. It's useful. It's useful information to have. So let's talk about these in a non-boring way. Let's talk first about the decorator pattern. Anybody heard this term, the decorator pattern, before? A few people. Everybody know what the decorator pattern is? Of course not. That's why you're here, right? The idea of the decorator pattern is composition over inheritance. Now, the truth is that inheritance is really great. In fact, most of these patterns that we're going to talk about today involve inheritance of some kind. But inheritance has limitations. Namely, in PHP, you can't inherit from more than one object. Now, Python supports multiple inheritance. I believe Ruby does, too. Any Ruby programmers? Sorry? OK, mix in. And in PHP 5.4, we got traits in PHP, which is kind of like multiple inheritance without really being multiple inheritance. And while we can in extend, or excuse me, implement from multiple interfaces in PHP, we can't do multiple inheritance. So. Let's say your boss comes to you and he says, we need to be able to print a string on a web page. And I need to be able to strip HTML, and I need to be able to make the string bold. Pretty simple, right? But then your boss realizes, because you know, your boss didn't write a spec, it might be that your, that your company wants to do both at the same time. Not just one or the other, but both. Well, you can't very well define a, you know, a, a class, make it bold, and a class, uh, strip HTML, and then you'd have to duplicate the code to use inheritance for this, right? We don't want to do that. We can use the decorator pattern instead, which looks something like this. So in this, we have an interface called printer. And printer implements one method called print string. Okay? This is our string decorator. Now, we're going to have a couple of classes. The first class that we have is called string printer. And all it does, it takes an argument of string, okay? It sets the string to something, and then it prints the string when you tell it to print the string. Make sense to everybody? Anybody confused by this? Cool. Everybody's with me so far. Okay. Now, 
this is our most basic idea, but we want to be able to do the, you know, make a bold or strip HTML out of it. Okay. So we want to define a couple of decorators for this. The first decorator we're going to do strips HTML. In this case, we have a class called strip tag sprinter. And instead of taking a string as its constructor argument, it takes a, a, a printer object. It takes another printer object and it sets printer. Okay. And then when you call print string, it ob start and uh, prints, you know, gets gets the string, and then cleans the, you know, gets gets the value, strips the tags, and prints it for us. Okay, makes sense so far. Everybody following along? Cool. We can make another decorator that makes the text bold. In this case, we have another constructor function which takes a printer object and stores it internally in the object, and then when you call print string, it prints a strong tag, calls the print string and then closes the strong tag because, you know, we're HTML5, you know, compliant, standards compliant people. We always close our HTML tags. So what this looks like is something like this when we use it together. If I create a new string printer by itself with a break tag and the word hello world and tell it to print it, it prints a string with a break tag that says hello world. If I instantiate a strip tags printer with a string printer and I print that, it strips the break tag out for me. Okay. If I instantiate a bold printer and pass it a string a strip tags printer and pass that a string printer, it prints a strong version of Hello World. Make sense? Follow along? Okay. Now this has some obvious drawbacks to it which we'll, we'll talk about. So this kind of looks something like this as a diagram. Okay? You have your printer interface, and that is what determines what it's going to look like. And uh, you have two different sides. On the left, you have the string printer. Okay? And this is what takes the string as a constructor argument and what actually does the work of printing the string. On the right, you have the decorators. And the decorators actually take the uh, printer as a constructor argument and do whatever it is they do and within with the printer, the actual string printer. Now, this decorator interface, which is here, actually doesn't exist. We never actually formally defined this. You don't have to because it's kind of implied. The idea here is the difference between the actual string printer itself and the decorator, the difference is what the constructor method takes as an argument. Does it take a string as an argument or does it take a printer interface as an argument. Does that make sense? Okay. Now obviously this has some drawbacks to it. Namely, uh, it's a little bit difficult to, uh, okay, so I can't simply pass in strip tags printer a string. I can't give it a string. I have to give it an object. So I can't just use this decorator by itself. I have to use this decorator in conjunction with string printer. And I have to know that, okay? I have to know that in order for this to work. And that's kind of a drawback of this particular pattern is that I can't just instantiate this by itself, okay? Also, my interface changes slightly because the construct method has different arguments based on which side of, of the thing you're on. And that's not a violation of what we talked about with the list style substitution principle. I will get there, trust me. <laughs> uh, but it, it, it does create a little bit of a problem. So let's talk about a different way you can decorate with traits. Traits were introduced in PHP 5.4. Anybody using PHP 5.4 in production? Okay, PHP 5.3 is end of life. Get your butts in gear. <laughs> it will no longer be supported in two months. So upgrade, those of you who didn't raise your hand. Don't make me send Chris Hargit after you. <laughs> okay. The concept of traits, for those who don't know, in 5.4 is that they are expressed in objects. They do not become part of the object's type. So it allows us to do kind of multiple inheritance. Okay. So this is kind of what interfaces and traits would look like. All right. We again define our interface of printer with print string. That makes sense. And then we define a couple of traits. Trait strip tags has a function called strip tags, and it gets the string and it strips the tags and then, you know, sets a string to that. Bold string does something similar. It, it takes a string and makes it bold. Okay. 
So we have a class called print string that implements printer. Same class as before. There should be nothing new in here. Constructor takes a string. The string is set to string, so on and so forth. All right. For bold string printer, we define a bold string printer. In this case, we tell it to use the bold string trait. Okay. And then it looks exactly the same. The only difference is here in this method right here, the print string, where I tell it first to bold the string, and then I tell it to print the string. Okay. Let's say I want to use the strip tags and the bold printer together. I can use both traits together. And again, I'm still taking a string as an argument. In this case, I'm stripping the tags, bolding the string, and then printing the string. Okay. So when I put them all together, it looks something like this. New print string, pass it a string, it does its thing. Bold string printer, it prints strong, and it doesn't actually have the strong. It got cut off, but it would have a closing strong tag on it. Bold string HTML, or bold no HTML string printer, pass it a string, that's what we get out. Okay. Now, there are some advantages here. I only have to instantiate one object. So it's pretty damn obvious by the class name what it is that I'm trying to do, and I don't have a whole bunch of long, you know, uh, object passing another object, passing another object, passing another object. And you, this could go on for a while depending on how complex your decorators are. Okay. Uh, I have, you know, the class names make it pretty obvious what it is. Um, I don't actually need entire objects and classes because, again, I'm never going to hint on those. So I don't really need a type. So, so we're good on that, you know. But, of course, there are some drawbacks. Namely, the amount of duplicated code. Okay. I have to print the string here. The constructor is the same. I have to print the string here. Constructor is the same. Okay, I have duplicated code. Depending on, on how uh, significant the duplication is, that may or may not be a bad thing. In this case, I probably wouldn't care so much. Uh, in a more complex object situation, I would care an awful lot. So traits are another way of decorating. Uh, you can pick the one that works best for you. Now, I saw Sean look at me funny when I said this wasn't a Liskov substitution violation. And you might think, well, right here is the violation because we're adding a construct method, right? And I said before, we can't change the interface. OK. The thing is that magic methods are not considered to be part of the interface. First, construct is the only one that takes, ar well, yeah, I think construct is the only one that takes arbitrary arguments. OK. Second, construct's going to be called if you actually look at the tokenization, it actually calls construct whether it's empty or not. Okay. Construct's always part of the interface. However, construct is designed to be used to format, excuse me, not format, um, initialize your object. The entire purpose of the construct is, is so that you can do object initialization. Okay. So when you have a, an object that requires configuration, that's a good place to put it as in construct, even if you, you know, define protected or whatever uh, to, do, to do the rest of it. Putting that in the interface, uh, excuse me, putting that in construct is where that goes. And that's not considered to be a violation. That's an exception to the rule of the uh, uh, Liskov substitution principle. Does that, does that make sense to you, Sean? <coughs> OK. When objects interact with each other, um, they, okay, so when I pass an object in, uh, it, the object that's using it knows it through its interface. That object is getting a fully constructed object. It's never calling the construct method, okay? The object, the methods that it knows, uh, those it's expecting to get. Now, if you're instantiating an object with a variable, you know, new variable, dollar sign, whatever, first let me slap you, but also, you know, let's, let's talk about how there are better ways to do that. Uh, so that's the difference, is because you're getting an instantiated object, you're not violating the rule. And in fact, the uh, adapter, not the adapter, the abstract factory and builder patterns help solve this problem. I saw a hand back there. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Don't do that, yes. Um, the only one you would really ever want to define is construct anyway. 
uh, but you can have different configurations. For example, my cache interface that we talked about earlier, uh, memcache is going to need configuration. So is a database connection. So those are going to need different configurations than, say, APC, which has no configuration, or the file system, which is going to have a file path, or uh, Mongo, which is going to have a different configuration. All of those configurations are independent to the implementation. Right. I couldn't, uh, yeah. Right, exactly. So, um, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, yeah, that may, that, that's very true. So, can, so magic methods should never appear in the interfaces. Now, you can put magic methods in abstract classes. That's allowed. That's okay. Because abstract classes allow you to define the functionality. So you may have a common constructor type functionality that you want to accomplish. And if you have to override that in the future, that's fine. You can use the parent call to, to call up to. Um, but in your interface itself, construct shouldn't, shouldn't appear. Similarly, I, and they may fix this. Can you still define properties in interfaces, public properties? OK. Constants, OK. I believe in 5.2 you could define properties. Um, I, yeah, yeah. But I think you could define properties in like either 5.1 or 5.2 uh, in interfaces. Don't do that either. <laughs> or maybe, maybe I'm imagining things. That's also possible. So. Any questions about this before we go on to the next pattern? Everybody can now go implement their own decorators? OK. I go over this, by the way, in detail in my book. I definitely recommend picking up a copy. A little plug there for you. <laughs> OK. Uh -huh. You're right. Or an iterator, iterator. I think, I think that's the base class, is an iterator, iterator. Yeah, it's an iterator that it iterates over iterators. <laughs> Somebody give me a shot. <laughs> um. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I, uh, I, 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 um, I wrote a chapter on iterators for my book, and, and it, oh, God. <laughs> The reason we're not going over them today, I could give a class on iterators. In fact, there is a class on iterators uh, tomorrow, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Why I use traits instead of just writing those in. Um, so, okay, so here I define the traits, right? Uh, script tags, bold, bold string, okay. And then over here I have bold string by itself, okay. And then the next one I define script tags, bold printer together. If I wanted just a script tag, right. In that case, I would have a lot of duplicated code, and that's why we use traits instead. They're essentially mix-ins in this case. Um, so, yeah, that's the idea there. Okay, yeah. All right, that's a good question. I appreciate you asking it because, you know, it may have been someone else that didn't, you know. Any other questions before we go on to the mediator pattern? Okay. Once we finish with this, I'll let you guys have a break um, because I also need to get something to drink. <laughs> All right. So the mediator pattern is an object between friends. And the problem that this is trying to solve is that you have too many objects. Anybody have too many objects? Yeah, that'd be uh, pretty much all of us. And in fact, a lot of us have applications that look like that. Okay. Yes, I realize that looks like a diamond with a star. That's exactly how I drew it. But this is exactly what our applications look like. All these objects are talking to each other. Okay. And the problem is that too many objects talking to each other creates tight coupling, where objects are tied together. Since, so coupling is a measure of inter interdependency. And tight coupling exists when an object is dependent on many other objects 
and those objects are in turn dependent upon them. And tight coupling reduces testability, reusability, so on and so forth. The idea in object-oriented programming is that I should be able to take an object or a set of objects in a library and use those in other applications or use those in a new and different way. Okay, Something that looks like this ain't usable for anything. <laughs> the solution here is the mediator pattern. And most of us have probably done this before. The mediator pattern does something like this, where instead of having all those objects talking to each other, they all talk to one object in the middle, and the whole, that object's job is to mediate between all of them. So in its simplest form, the, the mediator looks like this. You have a mediator and two objects. The objects talk back and forth to the mediator. They don't have to know that e each other exists, and everybody's happy. Okay. Anybody in here familiar with domain modeling? Okay, a couple of people so-so. Domain modeling does exactly the same thing. In domain modeling, when you're building a model, when you're building a model using this particular pattern, you have a gateway, and the gateway talks to whatever storage engine you're using and creates value objects. The value objects don't care about how they get stored, and the storage doesn't care about the value objects. And never the two shall meet, and everybody's happy at the end of the day. Okay. The reason that we do this, especially in model construction in MVC, is there's several reasons. And I have a whole talk on this. I'll give you the short version here. The value object represents to your application the data that you're storing. It represents the user or whatever, whatever concept you're representing, and it models that data. Okay. The storage engine, on the other hand, represents how the data relates to itself. So if you're using MySQL, it's a relational database. It's how the data relates to other parts of the data. But just because I have a table that stores uh, 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 an ID pair between user and phone number, uh, does not, you know, a many-to-many -many relationship, that doesn't mean that my application cares, and it doesn't mean I should have a model for that many-to-many -many relationship. It just means that that's how the database needs to know about it. So the job of the gateway is to talk to whatever storage I'm using, and that may actually be more than one. I might be talking to four different storage types. Or if you're using Socorro, which is the application I worked on at Mozilla, we had nine different types of storage. You might be talking to a bunch of different kinds of storage, collecting all that information and creating value objects. Your application goes on to use the value objects. It doesn't care about storage. The value object doesn't care about storage. And when it's time to save that object, you pass it back to the gateway that passes it onto the storage layer, and the storage layer stores it, and everybody's happy. It's testable, it's easy to work with, and you know the best part is there's no SQL in your code, other than in the gateway, I guess. Okay, that's the idea here behind this. The mediator pattern in code, if we were going to build this, looks something like this. You'd have a value object with a method called set values and a whole bunch of other methods too. Again, small slide. Uh, and set values would take an array and it would populate the value object. Data storage would store the values. Again, it would take an array, and it would save the, the values in some kind of a data storage layer. The mediator's job is entirely to do this. When I call save, it gets the, the, the values out of the value object and sends them off to the storage layer to be stored and processed. Note that the, 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 the gateway doesn't do anything else. It doesn't validate that the data is correct. It doesn't... Uh, filter the data to make sure that it's not going to cause SQL injection problems. It doesn't so much as uh, add two numbers together. It's just a conduit for information, passing it between two different layers of your application. It is the glue that holds two or more objects together. It does nothing else. That's its entire job. This is its single responsibility. The mediator pattern is really great for discouraging loose coupling because the objects don't actually talk to each other. The important thing to understand about the mediator pattern is that all the objects in the mediator pattern are colleagues. They are all equal objects on the same level, but they never talk to each other. They don't have to know that the others exist. Their entire reason for existing is to do whatever it is they were created to do, and then they send their data off to the mediator, which distributes it to everybody else. Okay? This encourages loose coupling because instead of me having to know about all these other interfaces and all these other objects, I only have to know the mediator. And the mediator, I can remove the mediator and stick some other object on there uh, that pretends to be a mediator, and that relationship exists and is perfectly fine. They work together. Everybody's happy. My code is happy. Solid is honored. 
Any questions? Yeah. Okay. You can use different design patterns in different parts of your application based on the problem that you're solving. And in fact, you can actually combine design patterns together. Okay? You could have the mediator pattern along with the adapter pattern along with some other pattern if you wanted. Um, uh, anybody in here use an MVC framework? Okay. Any of you familiar with the concept of the front controller? Most of you who use MVC, raise your hands. Okay. The front controller pattern and the MVC pattern are design patterns. They're actually really enterprise architecture patterns more than anything else. MVC is the mediator. It's a specific kind of mediator, but it is the mediator pattern. The controller is a mediator between the model and the view. So if you're passing your model to your view, stop that. <laughs> okay. The front controller is another mediator. The front controller mediates between all the other framework components okay, to, to handle routing. And if it's done correctly, I see Sean... Yeah, I, I see you shivering there. But if it's done correctly, its entire job is to mediate. Okay, so those two patterns are the mediator pattern in specific conceptual implementations, and that's the cool thing about patterns is you can mix and match these together. You can actually have two or three or four patterns working together to accomplish whatever it is that you're trying to do. Uh, so that's a good question. I appreciate you asking that. Um, so does that make does this make sense to everyone? I'm gonna take a break at this point if there are no questions um, because I need to get something to drink or I'm not going to be able to speak by the end of this. Yeah, exactly. All right, let's come back here. Let's say 2.30. It's about 15 minutes from now. Grab a drink. Uh, you know, grab a bathroom break. Grab a smoke if you do. All right, let's go ahead and get started with the second half. It's all right with you all. Standing for three hours is really difficult to do, especially when you hurt your back deadlifting. So um, I'm going to sit for a little bit. And, and uh, there's actually a live coding demo in here, too. And of course, I don't want to stand up to do. So, um, but if you have questions, sorry? There you go. Um, but if you have questions, like w wave your hand really big so I can you know, see you since I'm not you know, standing over you anymore, at least at the moment. All right, so let's talk about uh, the uh, abstract factory and the builder patterns. Okay, anybody heard of these patterns before? A few people. Okay. I mentioned earlier that creating objects is a responsibility. This, uh, the new keyword. Every time you're using the new keyword, that's an indication that you're doing some new job. Uh, creating an object is uh, its own responsibility, uh, and this creates some issues because. 
how do we go about creating objects uh, inside of other objects if creating objects is a responsibility itself? Uh, because then we have two responsibilities and that violates the single responsibility principle and we don't want to do that. The answer to that is that uh, to create objects to, to fulfill that responsibility, we can use a couple of different design patterns. Uh, in particular, that's what the abstract, excuse, yeah, abstract factory and the builder pattern are for. I see Adam's walking in here an hour and a half late. <laughs> our, our, our conference host, Adam, Adam Culp, everybody. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about these patterns a little bit. Let's talk about first the abstract factory. And the, the goal of the abstract factory is to simplify uh, the creation of simple objects uh, that are part of a library or a family of objects. And it would look something kind of like this. The client knows two interfaces. The client's the thing that needs the object that's being created. And the client knows two interfaces. The first interface that the client knows is the cache factory. And the cache factory is responsible for uh, the creation of the object. The other interface that the client knows is the interface of the object that's going to get back that's being created. Okay, So whatever's being created is being created as part of a common, normal, everyday interface. And the implementation of those things uh, is really up to uh, the developer and the client doesn't care. The, the client doesn't care how a particular factory gets uh, created. Uh, or what kind of how the factory works internally, and it doesn't care how uh, the particular cache or particular object gets instantiated. It only cares about the two interfaces that it knows. So I'm going to show you how you would create this uh, with a little bit of a live coding here, and I'm not going to run it because I'm not that brave. Flying planes is mostly stupid. <laughs> it takes 40 hours to get a private pilot's license. It takes another 40 hours to get an instrument rating. Okay. So let's imagine that we're going to use our cache interface. And we had uh, over here in our, our, our cache, we're going to reuse this cache interface that we had way back here. We're going to instantiate this particular cache. We're going to imagine this is our cache. And we have a cache. So now we have our cache interface, right? Um, and that, that's going to be the interface that the client knows. This is the object it's expecting to be created. Okay. And our abstract factory is going to have one method. Public method called create cache. Now, we don't have to tell it what kind of cache it's going to be creating because the actual concrete implementations of this interface are going to determine that for us. So let's go ahead and create a couple of concrete implementations. Okay, so we can say, okay, my memcache factory is going to instantiate a new memcache cache class. And we can do the same thing here with an APC factory. We copy the code, change it slightly. Okay, so these are my two factories. Now, Anybody in here ever used memcache before? 
few of you. So those of you who have used it know there's configuration to memcache, right? Okay. APC doesn't really have any configuration because APC is just local to the machine that it happens to be running on. But memcache has actual servers, and you can have an entire memcache cluster. And if you're Facebook, apparently you have an entire building full of memcache servers. So we're going to actually have to add some things to this. Now, we can do this in a couple of ways. We can assume that when the memcache factory gets instantiated, it's going to be past some kind of configuration. So we can say, and then we can assume that the memcache cache itself is going to need to use that config somehow too, right? So we can pass it the configuration. Okay. Now the APC factory doesn't have this problem. It doesn't have uh, any uh, configuration to pass along because it's just using a local server uh, and things like that. So there's no configuration to worry about. But that's you know th that makes things different. But our client isn't really going to care because the client's going to get the memcache factory already instantiated. So it doesn't know about the configuration and. When it calls create cache, it doesn't have to pass it any arguments because the configuration already exists in order for us to create the memcache cache object. Okay. Now, um, does that make sense to everybody? Is that is that clear? Okay. Now we can go ahead and use this cache interface to actually. this. And I find it just easiest to copy the public methods because that's what I'm going to be using anyway. And then we can implement these for our APC cache and complete the whole circle. And, you know, I think that's correct. I don't have the manual in front of me, and I you know, would look it up usually. You know, um, there's a method to do this. Let's just go with that because I don't know what it is off the top of my head. Okay, so this is the object that is that our client's going to get back. It doesn't really care about what the actual implementation is. It only cares about uh, that the interface that it gets back is what it's expecting. Does everyone follow along with this? Does this make sense? Any questions about this? Okay. So the idea here is that uh, the abstract factory is responsible for building the object, and then the object itself is responsible for doing the work. And then my client, all my client has to do is say, takes there we go and then somewhere in a in here you know and it has a all it has to do. Okay, it doesn't know anything other than the interface, and it, it you know it expects a particular return value, and that's that's all it cares about. So this is great for building simple objects, um, but we aren't always going to be building simple objects.
this is great if we want to build simple objects. If we want to build objects that have very basic configuration, um, if we want to build objects that the client doesn't have to have any part in, in actually telling it what to do. Uh, the other thing about this is that abstract factories will always return uh, the object they create as soon as the object is instantiated. An abstract factory doesn't hold on to it. It, it just, you know, the, the last step is to return it to the client that, excuse me, that requested it. Okay. Now, sometimes we're going to want to create a little bit more complicated object. For example, if we want to um, put together a mime email, for example, we might have a more complicated object that we want to build. And the way that we do this is by using the builder pattern instead. We can use the builder pattern to, to make this effective. So some objects are more complicated. They have a lot more steps to them. Uh, my email uh, response to an HTTP request, uh, uh, you know, turning Markdown into, into HTML or something like that, parsing HTML, something like that. And the uh, abstract factory isn't the best way to create those objects. So the builder pattern helps us have a little bit more flexibility in how we build our objects. And that looks a little bit like this, where you have some kind of a controller or a uh, client that's talking to a response builder uh, interface. And the response builder, based on the concrete type that it gets or based on parameters that it's given, knows how to instantiate and build certain types of objects. And it waits for the client to give it directions on what to build. Now, it has some similarities to the abstract factory. Uh, it only, the client only knows two interfaces. It knows the interface of the thing that it's building, uh, and it knows the interface of the object it's expecting to get back. It doesn't know or care about the internals uh, of the uh, building process. It only knows the interface that it's talking to. The client is responsible for managing the building process, whereas in the uh, abstract factory, the Factory was responsible for the whole building process, caching, configuration, all of that. In this case, the client is responsible for the building process because the builder doesn't necessarily know all the steps and all the things that go into what's being built. The builder knows how to build the object once it's told what to do, but it doesn't know how many of those steps it's going to be given to do. So uh, as a result, the created object only goes to the client after the client has finished building it or giving instructions to have it built, and then asks for it to be given. Okay, So the builder pattern might look a little bit like this, where you have a controller, and the controller, uh, in this case, has an account function. And if the user is authenticated, it redirects the user with a, a 301. Otherwise, it displays a template. Okay. In both cases, we have a request object, excuse me, a response object. And the response object, uh, we do one of one of a few things. One, we can set a redirect and then render that, or we can set a template and a title and then render that. It's up to our controller here to determine which action to take. The builder, on the other hand, is going to have a few different methods to it, set redirect, set template, so on and so forth. And then the response builder itself, which this I realize is really, really tiny, um, again, small slide, lots of code to put on it, uh, is going to be responsible for determining how to render the response and what kind of an object to return. Uh, these slides will be online, so you don't necessarily have to be able to read that right now. But any questions about this? Okay. You can use them together? Okay. Yeah, there is a way to use them together. Uh, and I have an example. Uh, you can use these together. Let's say you have an ORM that you want to use, okay? And in an ORM, uh, you have to instantiate it somehow. You might have, you know, MySQL ORM factory creates a MySQL ORM. And you might have a Postgres ORM factory that creates a Postgres ORM. But your ORM is going to have an interface in order to create your query, in order to set up your query, so on and so forth. And so even though you have a factory producing the ORM object, the object it's, it's giving to the client is an object that's a builder object. The whole point of that object is to construct another object so that you can execute a SQL query. And that's the idea 
uh, behind combining these patterns. That's one use. There are a whole bunch of other use cases where you can use these together and it makes it really useful. Any questions about that? Glad I could answer your question before you asked it. All right, let's talk a little bit about the singleton pattern. Anybody in here ever heard of the singleton pattern? How many of you think it's an anti-pattern? Okay, good number. At its most basic, the singleton is an object is a single instance of a particular object within a particular runtime. It is not possible programmatically to have two singletons of the same type at any time in the same runtime. Okay. And unlike most other design patterns, in PHP there's only really one way to express a singleton pattern. And it looks like this. To express a singleton and by the way, this is the singleton itself. This is none of the other stuff that the singleton would actually do for you. This is just the singleton. So in this case, you would have a private instance of the singleton itself. You have to set both construct and clone to private so that they can't be used from outside the object. And then you would have a static method called something, but in this case, it's get instance, that would check to see whether or not the singleton's been instantiated instantiate it if it has not, and then return the singleton to whoever requested it. Now, this is the very most basic singleton. There will only be one of these objects in any runtime. But of course, this doesn't really do anything except you know, create an object. You would obviously add other things to it to do something useful, hopefully. Uh, and, you know, and, and then, you know, so this, but this is the basic format that the singleton is always going to look like in PHP. There's really no other way to do this. Now, I've had a couple people ask me, do you have to mark construct and clone as final in order to ensure that they can't be subclassed later on? And the answer to that is you don't. Um, even though they could be subclassed and the visibility could be changed to, to public in, in the future, uh, and that would break the singleton, um, the, the idea here is to prevent accidental instantiation, not you being you know, a bullheaded programmer and overriding the whole thing. Um, so uh, again, the idea here is to avoid accidental instantiation, not prevent it entirely. But you could mark them as final, but you don't have to. Now, most of you who raise your hand about it being an anti-pattern know pretty well that the singleton doesn't follow any of the solid principles that we talked about before. In fact, it follows none of the solid principles that we talked about before. Let's take a look at it. The singleton instantiates itself. It can't be instantiated any other way. Now, if instantiating an object is a job in and of itself, then the singleton, by definition, has two jobs built in every single time you use it. Instantiating itself and whatever else you designed it to do. Unless you designed it just to instantiate itself, which I guess, <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, <laughs> it's a singleton for singleton's sake. That would, that, would, that would follow the single responsibility principle. OK. The uh, open-close principle. Uh, the open-close principle says that it should be open to modification, but closed, or open to extension and closed for modification. OK. But you can't really extend this. Because in PHP, yes, I realize that, that um, we added uh, late static binding. And you could write this to keep static binding and all of that kind of stuff, but it's, it, it's really going to be more work than it's worth. So it's really not open for modification, or extension, rather. Uh, Liskov substitution principle, uh, there's not really an interface here to type in on, so that's kind of gone. Uh, interface segregation principle doesn't even apply. And of course, uh, this is available globally, so uh, dependency inversion doesn't exist either for this. Uh, and not to mention that, the singleton's really, really hard to test. Anybody ever try to write a unit test for a singleton? Yeah. I'm surprised you're still here. I probably would have killed myself, jumped off a bridge. Uh, the singleton has a problem, two, well, several problems. The first one is, because it's available globally, it's not injected anywhere, OK? It's, it's available anywhere. The other thing is that unless your test completely killed a runtime every single time your test ends, then 
when you change the singleton in one runtime, if if by changing the singleton a test fails, every other test will fail too. It'll be a cascade effect, and you won't be able to tell whether it was the singleton that was broken or the actual code you were testing. Now, the singleton has some uses. Uh, anybody in here ever developed printer drivers in a previous life? Okay. I think we can all agree that we don't want to spool up more than one printer spool at any given time on our computers. We probably don't want to you know, print the same document 87 times because you know, we ended up in some recursion loop. Um, you know, so a good use of the singleton right there to ensure that. Um, sometimes we want to build a server that only has one instance. We only want one instance of that server running at any time. Um, uh, we use this in Socorro and in, in Mozilla, the project I worked on there, uh, where we actually had a monitor. And a monitor, there was only one instance of the monitor, and we only wanted one instance, and that was a singleton. Great use of the singleton. The singleton has its uses, but they're really few and far between. My best advice to you is to avoid this, because it's probably a better way to do whatever it is you're trying to do without using the singleton. Now, you could use the singleton for like registry patterns uh, or uh, dependency container or something like that. Those are valid uses of the singleton. But again, we have more modern, more reasonable ways to do this. So if you're thinking about using a singleton, uh, the best advice I can give you is to think really, really hard about why you're using a singleton, why this makes sense, why this is the best solution to the problem at hand. My guess is you will find a better one. Any questions about that particular pattern? Anybody have horror stories they'd like to share? Yes, you do. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. so if you if it, caching is the same way, uh, I've seen people they'll try and use a singleton for caching because after all, I only need one cache, right? <laughs> Until they find out that they actually need to use APC for some things and memcache for others, and oh by the way, we'd like to use Redis for this over here, and all of a sudden you have the same problem with the database connection where you have more than one or need for more than one and you can't make more than one. So <laughs> thank you for, for your horror story. Uh, the bottom line is, if you're thinking about using the singleton pattern, I, I highly recommend you use something else. Um, and and if, you, if you'd like my number and you'd like, me to call, uh, you'd like to call me and have me yell at you for using the singleton pattern, I'll be more than happy to oblige. Uh, <laughs> so all right. Let's talk about uh, the adapter and the facade patterns. This is where I get to beat up on Laravel. Any Laravel people in the room? A couple of people, OK. Hopefully, they won't be jumping over the chairs. Sean, your job is to keep them from jumping over the chairs and attacking me. <coughs> yeah, OK, all right, all right. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> That's like, that's, that's like using, that's like using WordPress for scaling a website. <laughs> I don't know. All right. Uh, the adapter and the facade patterns are really similar patterns. They're very, very close to each other, and they look very similar, but they actually have very different jobs. And they actually both look kind of like mediators. And we'll talk about. I'm sorry. Do they really? Okay. I, all right, I've never seen that, but maybe they do. But we'll talk about the differences. Anybody ever had this problem? 
We don't all write the code that we're using. Someone else did. That that idiot who decided at four o'clock in the morning that uh, uh, you know he he was going to come up with some cool library and, and yeah you 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 were the idiot at four a.m. who came up with the library. Yeah, and, and now the whole company is built on that library. <laughs> and the, the the worst thing is that it's the worst library ever, and it has this guy's name in it everywhere because he thought he was awesome. <laughs> okay, and. You go to your boss and you say, we really need to rip out Tom's library. And unfortunately, the boss is Tom. <laughs> okay. All been there. We all have this problem, right? We don't get to write all the code we use. And this is actually probably a good thing because if we had to write everything from scratch every time, none of us would ever get anything done. We'd all be writing database adapters for the rest of our lives and, and, and probably jumping off of tall buildings. It would, just, it would just be bad. It would be horrible. So... But we all have this problem. We're using someone else's code. Framework, library, whatever, we're using someone else's code. A lot of times, very similar, punk com very similar components are built very differently. For example, um, if you are working with MongoDB and you are working with Cassandra DB, okay, they essentially do the same thing. They store things, I think, in JSON. Both of them are JSON, right? I haven't used Cassandra. Okay. They both store JSON objects. Can you just easily switch from Mongo to Cassandra? Probably not. They're very, very different interfaces. But yet they do almost exactly the same thing. They store data in JSON in a database. Okay. Well, our job as programmers is to make our lives easier. Because to be a good programmer, the first rule of being a good programmer is you're lazy. That's why we became programmers in the first place. We got tired of doing math by hand, right? At least that's why I became a programmer. So what we've done is we've come up with this idea called the adapter pattern. The adapter pattern, the intent of the adapter pattern is to make two different interfaces exactly the same. You've probably done this before. You've probably at some point had two components that were different and said, I need to make some way that I can use either one of these components based on my configuration. So you've come up with some object that talks to both of them uh, in their own language, but the interface looks the same. Okay? And we've already done this today, in fact. Remember this? This seems to be getting around today, right, this interface? This caching interface, this is an adapter interface. Because we're saying our cache is going to have these four methods. And it doesn't matter whether we're using the file system. I showed you this slide already. It doesn't matter if we're using the file system. We'll just, turn, we'll just take those four methods and translate. Using APC, we'll take those four methods and translate. Memcache, Redis, uh, MongoDB, a database, uh, a dummy cache. <laughs> if, you, uh, if you ever want to do testing, you'll implement some kind of a dummy cache, or it just you know, throws it away. We didn't design the caches. I didn't invent APC or Memcache or any of those things, but I can design the interface. I can tell my application what to expect regardless of which one I'm actually using. And that's the cool thing, is I get to decide. I get to design the interface. Now, the adapter pattern looks something kind of like this. Your client talks to a target, and the target is the interface that it knows. The target is that cache interface that we, we wrote that has those four methods. Okay. Now, that target, in turn, knows how to translate in its concrete objects between various types of caches, or databases, or whatever it is that you're doing. And in turn, that translation can talk to the individual layers. Okay. The client doesn't care about memcache, APC, database, file system. It doesn't care. It doesn't know. It doesn't have any interest in knowing that. All it knows is its target interface. The target interface, its job is to translate. OK. Who here thinks this looks like the mediator pattern, one object translating for others? Okay. It looks very similar to the mediator pattern. Here's the difference. In the mediator pattern, all the objects are colleagues. All the objects are on equal levels. In the adapter pattern, these objects are subsystems. Okay. The translation is happening to subsystems. Okay. Now, uh, and that's the key difference. The other thing is that while the mediator's job is to simply translate between two Two or, um, two or more objects. In this case, this might have to rewrite some of the requests. It might have to do some other work. 
in order to make this work. Okay. The adapter pattern makes it possible for the Liskov substitution principle to function because I can now switch from one cache to another easily, instantly, by changing my configuration. And theoretically, if I've done my, my, my job correctly, my application shouldn't break. Chances are good it's going to break anyway because, you know, I probably made a mistake. But the idea is it shouldn't break. Okay. Let's see. We talked about that. Uh, mediators mediating between colleagues. Adapters translating between interfaces. Any questions about that? Does that make sense? Cool. Let's talk about the facade pattern. Now, if you've ever done Laravel before, uh, this, th we're not talking about Laravel facades. We're talking about actual facades. The facade pattern exists to take a complex subsystem and turn it into a, a simpler interface. The problem here is you have a complex subsystem that a higher level system has to access. And we don't want to create that diagram where we have five objects that all talk to each other. The way we solve this is we create a facade. The facade's job is to create a common interface between all of these subsystems so that our higher level interface can use it. Now, facades often tie together unrelated subcomponents. For example, uh, you might have to tie together, uh, you know, for image, for image crea creating images, you might tie together a JPEG library and a GIF library and all these other things together in order to do images. And you might have a common facade that can do all of these things but they're not related to each other. They're individual libraries. The other thing about facades that makes them unique is that facades create an interface where there wasn't one before. Okay? So unlike the adapter pattern, where there already is a set of interfaces, they just happen to be different, and we're creating a common unified interface, oftentimes these components don't have any interfaces with each other. So we're creating a new interface. We're essentially defining an interface that our application can use. Now, the problem here is that we're defining, uh, we're violating the single responsibility principle because our facade has several jobs to talk to different interfaces. And it's not a mediator because it's not just passing information. It has to be able to understand the internals and instantiate these objects and handle that. We are accepting the violation of the single responsibility principle and creating our facade in order to not violate it elsewhere in our application. We are saying, I'm going to violate this here because I have all these lower level subsystems that I need to tie together. I am willing to violate this rule here so that the rest of my application doesn't have to break it. And that is, is um, you know, that in a perfect world, we'd never have to do this. But we don't, we don't live in a perfect world where we get to decide how all the code works. So we're basically saying, I'm going to break the rules here in order to not break them later on. Yeah. Exactly, choosing the lesser of two evils. Um, you know, uh, if I had to choose between a facade or an adapter, I choose an adapter because it doesn't violate the single responsibility principle, but it also can't talk to more than one subsystem. So, I mean, you know, here because we're talking to two or more subsystems, and um, we're essentially creating a common interface, there's a chance that I'll have to do more data manipulation than I would with a mediator. Um, if, if that makes sense. Any other questions about this? Yeah. Let me think for a second. An actual example of where you would use this. Okay. Um, this will be a, a uh, abstract example because in PHP we don't do this a lot. Um, but imagine that you're building some kind of a build system and you have to uh, uh, integrate several different compilers together to compile various bits of the code together. Uh, you might create a facade so that whatever is, is responsible for running that process can talk to the facade. Uh, obviously, we don't do that very often in PHP, but that might be a case. Uh, if you're doing graphics processing, uh, there are a whole bunch of different graphics libraries available to you, uh, especially lower level systems. You might create a facade that can talk to each one of those. So you tell it, uh, here's my graphics data, and oh, by the way, I want that as a PNG or a GIF 
or a JPEG or you know SVG, and it knows which system to talk to, and you're creating a, a common interface for those. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Hmm. Huh. Interesting. Yeah, that would that would make sense. That would work. Yeah. 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 Yeah, that that makes sense too. That's a good example. Thank you. I'll have to put that in my library. <laughs> so you might look at the facade and say, how on earth is this not an adapter? Uh, because it looks very similar, right? It looks very, very similar. And the, the answer is that adapters create a common interface for similar objects. Facades create an interface for unrelated objects. Now, similar and unrelated are kind of subjective terms. Um, you might think that your hybrid objects are similar to each other. I would say they're unrelated. You know, they have different state, um, you know, things like that. Uh, graphics libraries, you know, sure, maybe a, a JPEG is similar to, to a GIF, but they're still different libraries. By similar, what we're talking about is, is basically has the same behavior, has the same function. And unrelated, they have different functions or different sets of information. And the truth is that some patterns actually look very, very similar, uh, but have different, different, some patterns look similar, and in fact, some patterns might even be coded the same. You could implement a facade that looks exactly like an adapter or an adapter that looks exactly like a facade. Your intent is what makes a difference. How you intended to use it is what makes a difference between whether it's an adapter and a facade or a mediator and one of these objects. Because even if the code is the same, it, the design pattern is not based on the code. It's based on the relationship between the objects. Okay. Any questions about that before we move on to the next design pattern? Cool. Let's talk about the chain of responsibility. Anybody heard of this pattern before? A couple of people. <laughs> the problem here is that you want to be able to handle particular tasks or filters in a particular order. And you want to be able to define that order. And you want it to look something kind of like this, where our first object passes the task on to the second, on to the third, and so on and so forth. And here, either the object handles the request or it passes it along. So if the request is handled, it, it, it's done, it returns, everybody's happy. If it's not done, then it passes it along to the next object in the chain. Okay. The solution to this is the chain of responsibility interface where we chain objects together and give them different responsibilities. And each of the responsibilities in the object chain, uh, it, it tries to handle it. And if it doesn't, it passes it along. And if we were going to write code for this, it might look something like this. Here, we're saying, OK, I have a handler. I'm going to have a function called a point successor uh, that, that appoints a particular successor. I'm going to have a function called pass message. It passes it if it, you know, it can't, and then uh, an abstract function uh, that's undefined for how to handle it. And in this case, I'm using email message. I'm assuming that uh, I'm filtering on email. For example, let's say I wanted to apply spam rules. I might use something like this to apply spam rules. Now, you might notice that I didn't use an interface there. I used an abstract class. In all the other examples, I've used an interface. And, um, but in this case, I use something different. The reason that I use an abstract class is because that abstract classes actually provide me an interface. Believe it or not, even though I define an abstract class, I actually define an interface here because I define the public methods that are available. Okay. These methods here, and actually that's protected, so it's actually not even part of my interface. But the public method here, a point successor, is part of the interface. And I'm also defining this as being part of the interface here. Okay. I'm saying that the public function handle message, that's going to be part of the interface as well. The reason that I'm doing this here with an abstract class instead of an interface is because I actually have common behavior that I want all of my objects to have. I want them all to know how to do this, how to appoint a successor, 
And I want them all to know how to pass the message along to the next successor. Okay? Exactly how I handle that is entirely up to the implementation. It's entirely up to whatever filter it is that I'm building. But the process of appointing and handling successors is a common functionality that I don't want to have to repeat this code over and over and over again. So using an abstract class here makes sense because my children of this are all going to have that common behavior in them. And they're all going to share this interface. There's only going to be those two public methods. Any questions about the difference between interface and abstract class and PHP? Does this all make sense? Yeah. Sorry? If, if I define it as static? I don't know. I don't know, Steve. You're right. You know what? You're right. You can because a lot of people will define, if they're defining just a collection of functions as a class, they'll define them that way with a static and then mark it up right. Yeah. Now, um, because I didn't actually define it, I have to define both the class and the uh, method as abstract because I didn't actually define the method. I don't have to do that in an interface because it's assumed them all, they'll all be abstract, but in this case, I actually do have to call it abstract. Um, so, any other questions that I can answer? Okay. So let's say we get to the end of the chain. Now what do we do? So eventually, let's say we run through all of our handlers and we reach the end of the chain. Now, now what, what, what's, what are our options? It's usually considered bad to fall off the end of the chain. Okay. Theoretically, if there's no successor, it's just going to fall off the end of the chain. It's going to go in a never, 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 never land, and you'll get a re null response back, um, you know, because theoretically it's, it's, it's returning all the way down the chain, and it'll return a null response, right? So you have a few options available to you. First one, you can always return an exception. You can add a little bit of code here that says, if I don't have a handler, so in this case, there's a return. If we, if we don't pass through the return because there's no successor, we'll throw in the exception saying, I don't have a handler, and we can deal with that. So if falling off into the chain wasn't on our, our list of things that we we're expecting, uh, then, then we can, we can, that, that's an exception, and we can handle that. If we're building something like a router uh, where we're uh, you know, routing for uh, HTTP resources, we can always raise a 404, uh, have some kind of a default handler. Uh, 404 in this case would be a default handler uh, that you put on the end of the chain. If there's nothing I can do with this, then have some kind of a default. Uh, that would be your second option. Uh, but there are some cases where you want to fall off the chain. Failure by design. So uh, if I'm doing actual spam handling, if I don't, if one of my handlers doesn't match the criteria of the message, that's probably actually a good thing. That means I didn't, you know, actually find that it, the message was spam. So falling off the end of the chain and getting a null response is a good, good response to have. That's okay as long as that's what I'm expecting. The key here is that if you fall off the chain and you weren't expecting that, your application isn't going to work. And similarly, constructing the chain is really, really important. How you actually put this thing together, because each object is basically like building, building recursion. If you've ever done recursion before, you have to be really, really careful how you build your chain so that... Um, you, you, you know, your chain is constructed correctly. Because if you have something like a greedy regular expression, it might return early. Or this one, this, this is always fun. If you happen to appoint a successor that has already been appointed as a successor, you will get into a recursive loop, and you will never exit. <laughs> and you will sit there and watch your application spin until it eats all of your memory. Or I guess if you have Xdebug installed, it'll error out at a certain recursion level. So, Any questions about the, the chain of responsibility? Yeah.
an interesting question. You can use decorators very similarly to this. I would say, for me, I would use the chain of responsibility when each task is discrete. Um, you know, the, the, the idea of the decorator is that the decorator decorates something, right? You have some object and you want to decorate it. Uh, the chain of responsibility, each object seems to have some discrete task associated with it, whatever that task happens to be. And I could drop one or add one based on configuration at runtime. Um, and I might want to reorder them. With the decorator, I can't reorder the initial foundation piece. Uh, where with the chain of responsibility, I should be able, assuming not no greedy regular expressions, I should be able to reorder them any way I want uh, and still have that work. Um, but it's kind of a fine line. The other, the other thing is, what is it that you're, you know, trying to, like, what is it you're trying to accomplish, right? Like with decorators, you might have a, a have, you know, five or six. I mean, at some point, the number of decorators you have gets so so big that it becomes unwieldy to deal with. That might be another case to consider changing to a, a different kind of pattern. But that's a good question. It's kind of a judgment call based on what you're trying to accomplish. Um, but that would be mine, discrete versus indiscrete. Uh, whether or not the, de the decorators are all dependent upon the base thing, uh, chain of responsibilities are not dependent on the, uh, a base thing. Did you have a question? It sounds very much like like this particular pattern. <laughs> I would say this is very close to this pattern, but it, it's essentially the same thing. Where, um, in this case, though, you can change it slightly. But in most cases, the chain of responsibility either handles it entirely or doesn't handle it at all. Is that? I think that's been my experience with it. Um, um, but I guess you could have it handle it slightly and then pass it on. Um, but that might be a visitor, yeah. That would be more of a visitor. The problem with handling it partially and passing it on, and the reason I don't really like the visitor pattern is it's hard to know what changed what. Like where in the chain did this get modified? Um, and so I, I like I like discrete, uh, you know, either it is spam or it isn't kind of thing. Based on rules, but you know, it's 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 kind of up to you. Um, I don't I don't go over the visitor pattern in my book, um, but it's worth knowing. I think it gets used a lot less now than it used to. Um, but I went over some tree pattern. I <laughs> can't remember off the top of my head which one it is. Any other questions before we go on to the strategy pattern? Okay. Let's talk about the strategy pattern. This pattern probably almost everybody in the room has used because it's 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 very basic. The idea here is that depending on the context, we may want to switch how we execute our code. And we may also not want to make use of inheritance when we do it. Inheritance may not be powerful enough. We may want to use composition over inheritance. Uh, aggregation, something like that. So the strategy pattern looks something like this. We have an interface called strategy, and I stole this right off Wikipedia because it was the best example I've ever seen in my life. Uh, the, your strategies will be much more complicated than this. Public function execute, A, B, that's it, okay. And then we define a couple of implementations. An add, where we add the values together and return it. Subtract where we subtract the values and multiply where we multiply the values. Simple enough. 
And then based on the con you know, context, we pass in the strategy, we execute the strategy, and we get the result. Every person in this room has done this at some point. This is a very, very easy common pattern. Based on the context and the implementation, uh, the, you know, the object that we've instantiated, that's basically how the strategy pattern works. There is a variation on this, which I didn't put in slides, which is that the context can actually decide, based on what it knows, which object to instantiate. And its job is to instantiate the particular strategy that it needs and then pass the information to the strategy. Uh, that's another particular uh, pattern, and that's actually what I go over in my course. Uh, sometimes the, the context will pick the strategy that it's going to use. Any questions about this? Okay. The strategy pattern relies on a common interface, this particular interface in this case. Um, and the strategy assumes that uh, all strategies are going to look the same, at least as from a public perspective. And the strategy pattern also makes use of aggregation rather than inheritance. So uh, rather than inheriting from a base class, uh, each, each strategy is going to implement uh, the interface on its own. Uh, and the idea there is that, uh, you know, I mean, that's basically the idea behind the strategy pattern. So any questions on that? I'm actually running ahead of schedule, so if you have questions, please ask them. Let me see if I can pull it out of my book. Okay, so, <coughs> excuse me. <laughs> Forgot I was wearing a microphone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, I'm trying to remember how I did this. Okay, so here is a case where uh, the API, handle API data is actually determining the type of the data and then uh, it's determining uh, which strategy to instantiate. So if it's XML, it instantiates an XML data strategy. If it's JSON, it instantiates a JSON data strategy. Uh, and then it has a function called process data, um, you know, which identifies the data type and then handles it. And the idea here is that uh, the strategy has a common interface called handle data. But how we implement the strategy itself uh, is dependent on on case by case scenario. Now I didn't write an XML version because I didn't want to write a book on XML and how to use simple XML and PHP. Um, but the idea here is that uh, in this case it simply returns uh, an array of data, and the uh, handle API determines which version of the strategy to instantiate. Is that a little less abstract version for you? Okay. So this is. The XML version is really awful, which is why it's not here. Because you don't need 47 pages of XML code, you know, uh, in a design patterns book. It's really not going to help you understand. Um, so, you know, but that's the idea: is that in this case, handle API data. Uh, its job is to determine which strategy to use. Um, and there are other case. There, are, there are a couple of different ways you can you can pass data to the strategy. Sometimes people just pass the data to the strategy itself, like in this case. Other times I've seen it where if the strategy is extremely complex, they'll pass the context to the strategy itself. Uh, this is a less common approach, um, but I've done it. Uh, I've done it where I've handled HTML and I've, I've uh, uh, had to deal with like uh, turning anchor tags into something else. I have to find the end of the anchor tag. So I have to scroll through the HTML, so I, I pass it the context to find the next endpoint and then, you know, return that. Um, so there are a couple ways to do that. Um, and it can be, I mean, it, it, it can really, 
you can get very complicated. The idea here with the strategy pattern is to separate the logic of whatever it is you're doing from, you know, otherwise what you end up with is you end up with a switch here where you're doing JSON, XML, and all the code is right here in your handle API data. And you end up with this big, ugly code mess that has more than one job. And that's what we want to avoid. So any questions about that? Take a look at the observer pattern. Yeah. You mean because it's instantiating an object? You could. You could have a factory to create the strategy. I think in this case, I would say that um, uh, it really only has one job. Its job is to instantiate the right thing and get rid of the data. Um, if you're concerned about it having too many jobs, you could use a factory. But I think in that case, you'd almost be creating lasagna code instead of, um, like, I don't think you'd win anything by doing that. Um, you know, because if you're writing, you know, the idea here is we want it to be testable. Well, I can test here that I get the right thing back, right? Like, um, and if I really, like, it, it, it returns handle data. You know, if I really wanted to, I could um, uh, I could write a test, and I could theoretically, mo I guess, mock this and figure out what object am I getting back, and to, and to test that that actually returns the right thing. Um, you know, and in this case, um, I think you could could easily test either each of these strategies individually, and then you could test that you get back the right object. Um, you know, yeah, yeah. And, and JSON and XML don't. So, um, but it, if if the issue is that you're getting that, you know, you're instantiating an object inside of a of a class, um, and you know, testing becomes an issue, then a factory might make sense for that. Um, so it really just depends on your use case. Any question? Any other questions? Okay, this is our last pattern. So uh, we're going to be finishing a little early here, it looks like. And that's okay. Uh, if you have questions and you haven't asked them or I haven't answered them, uh, feel free to ask them towards the end of the session. Um, I'll be happy to answer them for you. You know, you, my time is your time. So the last obje uh, object, last design pattern we're going to talk about is the observer pattern. You don't tend to see the observer pattern in PHP too often. You tend to see it more in uh, real-time like applications, JavaScript, things like that, where you want one object to watch the state of another. But there are some use cases in PHP that I think make this worthwhile. And it's such an easy pattern to understand, too, that I almost think it's like a freebie. Like, you should at least have this in the back of your mind to be able to identify it. Also, if you're any kind of a, a, of a professional developer, you're probably going to encounter JavaScript at some point. And you'll see this pattern from time to time. So the problem we're trying to solve here is that one object should change when another object changes. Especially if we're like, you know, doing something uh, that is interdependent, uh, where we're watching an object. Uh, for example, let's say that you change a value object. You might have another value object that needs to change too because they they are related to each other somehow. So if you decouple an account from a group, you might have to change the group object as well. One might have to watch the other. And the way you can do this is actually very simple. This is what the diagram for the observer pattern looks like. You have a subject that has a relationship to the observer. The subject has the ability to register and deregister the observers, and then a, a way to notify the observer when a change takes place. And the observer itself only has one method that's required, which is the notification method. We have to have some way to tell it that something happened. Now, it has concrete observers that decide what to do with the information. But you know, it, 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 we only care about the interface. If we were going to implement this in PHP, it looks something like this. A couple of interfaces, a couple of objects. Say, OK, register observer, unregister observer, notify observers, you know, uh, that kind of thing. By the way, free tip, if you ever 
are doing something where you're like unregister observer, and you want to actually unregister the actual object that you passed in, your triple equals will evaluate the object that it's the exact same object you passed in. So double equals will evaluate that the type matches. Triple equals will evaluate that the object is actually what. I learned that the hard way. Now, there are a couple of really easy mistakes to make with this particular pattern. The first, the, you can create a push system or you can create a pull system. Both of those are bad. And we'll talk about a little bit about why. In a push system, the subject determines what the observer wants. So the, the subject makes a change. And then in the notify method, it says, what do my observers want to get from me? And it makes a decision about what the observers want, and it pushes the information to the observers. Okay. The problem here is that this requires the subject to know the observer. And by know the observer, I'm not talking about knowing the observer's interface. I'm talking about knowing the observer's internals. It actually has to know what the observer does. It has to know what the observer cares about, and it has to know what the observer's purpose is. Okay. We want to avoid this because the subject, while it's under observation, it shouldn't have to know about the observers. And in fact, whether I register an observer or not, the subject shouldn't actually care. While the subject actually has a reference to the observer, it shouldn't know what the observer is observing it for. Okay? That's not the purpose of the subject. That's not what the subject is designed for. The other type of system is a poll system, where the subject notifies the observer that the, that the subject has changed, and the observer interrogates the subject for details of what that change was. This requires the opposite, where the observer knows the subject, but it also requires that the observer have a reference to the subject, that it be able to, to go and look at the subject. And the problem here, there are two problems. The first one is that the observer should be able to observe multiple objects. Okay? And it should uh, not know about who it's observing, it should only know about the messages that it's getting. The subject is the one that holds the relationship to the observer, not the other way around. The other problem is the reverse of where the subject had to know the observer. In this case, the observer has to know the subject. Okay, that, that tightly couples the observer to the subject, and the observer is no longer useful for a generic context. So we want to avoid doing that. The way we do that is the subject should tell the observers everything. Every time the subject changes, the subject should tell the observer that a change took place. In whatever format we're expecting the observers to get that information, the subject should tell the observers that something has changed. Okay. And then, once the observer has the message, the, the observer can decide what it cares about. So imagine that you're logging, you're doing logging, and you are using an observer model where the log is observing all the subjects. You notify the observer of a debug level alert. Okay. The subject isn't responsible for knowing whether or not the uh, the subject isn't responsible for knowing whether or not uh, the observer cares about debug level alerts, because in production we're probably not logging that, right? We're probably logging errors, warnings, things that are significant. But in, in uh, development, we want to log everything so we can see it. But the subject still sends that message off to the observer. By configuration, the observer determines what information it logs. Okay? And so it says, I'm in production. I don't log debug messages. It throws it away. Okay? That's the observer's job. The subject's job is to just send it everything that it's supposed to. It isn't supposed to decide whether or not, it doesn't care about the configuration. It doesn't care whether or not we're logging debug messages right now or not. It doesn't care about any of that stuff. It just sends the message to the logger. The logger decides what to do with it. Okay. Similarly, we might have a case where we have different observers, and if an observer gets a, a, a fatal error, it sends a text message off to our phone. Okay. The, the subject doesn't know that. All the subject does is it sends the message along. And the job of the subject is to hold that reference to the observer. So the subject knows about the observers that are observing it, only in the sense that it knows about these objects. But the observer's uh, internals and how the observer works and what the observer does, the subject doesn't care. So 
Um, any questions about the, this, this particular pattern? Yeah. I'm sorry? So when I wrote my book, I originally called this the public subscribe pattern. Um, and the technical editors that I had objected to that. Uh, their idea was that the public subscribe pattern um, is a particular kind of sub pattern to this. And I can't remember all the details about it. Uh, but it's very, very similar. Um, and I don't know that there's any difference. I, I, like, I like public subscribe as a name better than observer myself. Um, but apparently that name has a particular meaning. So, yeah. That might be. That might be. Yeah. I, I can't comment on it specifically because I don't know the code well enough. Um, Okay. Well, there you answered your own question. <laughs> Glad you learned something. <laughs> My work here is done. <laughs> yeah, I think I think you're right. If it's mediating between them, um, uh, it might also use it. It might be a dispatcher pattern that it's using. I don't know if there is. Um, I mainly went with the gang of four because they kind of form the foundation of of pretty much every pattern, um, and there are like 500 patterns. You could literally make a career out of studying these things. Um, I have more important things to do, but you know, you, you could. Um, so, anyway, um, did you have a question? I saw a hand. Uh -huh. Any other questions I can answer? This is our last pattern, so if you have questions about what we talked about today, please feel free to ask them. Yeah. Okay. Strings. I think that it is a decorator. Um, the idea of the decorator is that you're kind of like mixing things together to accomplish whatever it is that you're trying to do. Um, and I think you can use mix-ins. Um, I don't think you'll find it in any of the official books, um, but I, I think that it works just as well uh, to, to use traits for that. Um, but that's my personal opinion. You know, um, yeah. No, you, you, you're right. You're right. You can't make a runtime decision, but you can you could create enough objects that you could, yeah, I mean, you know, you right. And, and that's the other thing that decorators are good for. Um, uh, yeah. Exactly. Exactly. So it's kind of six to one. Um, it depends on what you're going for. But if you're, I mean, if you're getting to the point where you have 15 decorators, you may want something like chain of responsibility instead. So. so. Any other questions? Okay, um, I have a book on this topic um, that you can pick up a copy of. Uh, it's called Practical Design Patterns in PHP, and you can actually get 10% off with the Sunshine PHP code. Um, I appreciated having you guys today. I'll be here after for a little bit if you want to come up and ask questions. Uh, please rate this on Joined In. If you have an account on Joined In, or even if you don't, please rate this. Um, it helps me and, and anyone else you rate this weekend uh, it helps us to make our talks better so that uh, we can do, you know, we can do this again and we can, we can help other audiences learn too. So uh, thank you for coming and I'll be here if you have questions. <laughs>